Welcome back. All right, so uh, tonight I watched Rampage. Um, I, I figured out the whole streaming on TSN thing. Not that it's not without its glitches. It is. Uh, in that at, at the top of the hour when the show was supposed to get started, I, I had a black screen. I had to reload it, and then suddenly everybody's in the ring. So we started off with Pac versus Andrade. I keep wanting to say Pac because I think I see that. I think X-Pac old and all so it's pack versus andrade this was an interesting match and i think this is what was supposed to happen at the pay-per-view and they gave these guys a lot of time which may have hurt some of the other segments in the show but i think this was designed to say all right we couldn't have this at the pay-per-view we're going to get the storyline told here tonight it's going to take about half an hour so first off pack sends the lucha brothers to the back which is a foreshadowing of the storyline to come if the Lucha Brothers had been at ringside, the storyline to come wouldn't happen. Uh, lots of high-flying tactics by both wrestlers. Andrade blew me away with some of the moves he did, and then Pac did the same. And honestly, they have great chemistry. I look forward to their next match, which I assume... I, I assume they're going to have this feud hold over until probably November. Um, and I, I think they can do that. Uh, and I, I don't know that we're done with the Lucha, Lucha Bros... Andrade thing yet. Uh, so it was counter for counter. A uh, really good match. I, I was impressed with the counter moves done by both wrestlers. Uh, some of it, yes, it looks kind of telegraphed, but honestly, it was very impressive and it was a good showing for both. So Andrade wins the match, but it was with Chavo's help and it was a bizarre finish overall. It was weird. So I was like, well, I, I'm not sure I understand that finish. And then, um, uh, after that, he decks Chavo. So he was shown what happened and that Chavo would help him beat Pac. So he decked Chavo. And then the Lucha Bros come out and uh, they, they attack Chavo. They gave him a, 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 a double super kick, roll him into the ring, and Pac locked him into the Brutalizer. And I'm guessing that's the end of Chavo Guerrero in AEW. That Andrade now will move forward without him. So, I, I mean honestly, Chavo at this point, he can he can work backstage. He can do all kinds of different things. He doesn't have to be an on-air personality. And he was just basically the, the, the mouthpiece for Andrade, right? So that is all done. And like I said, that took a while, which I felt like impacted the next segment. Uh, it was Darby Allen and Sting, and it was supposed to be this interview thing, and it felt rushed. Absolutely felt rushed. Uh, Sting calls out Tully Blanchard, which is weird. Tully's not actually going to wrestle, right? They're not going to do that, right? Tully, Tully Blanchard's wrestling days are behind him, correct? I say this because I, I don't know. But Tully comes out, and while he's out talking to Sting, he the funniest thing that Tully said, maybe in his entire life, he said tonight where he said, Oh, Sting, you're always with the numbers game. Yeah, yeah, no, Sting, you're getting that backwards, Tully. Sting got the crap beat out of him by the NWO because it was like 80 to 1. Sting in the 80s was getting whooped by all four members of, of the Horsemen. It was, he'd be in against Flair, and then before you know it, Tully, Arn, and Lex have hit the ring, or Sid, or whoever that fourth member was for that week, and they, they beat up Sting. Sting has always been on the other end of the uh, manpower advantage. He's always the shorthanded one. So while he's saying this baffling thing to Sting, uh, Sean Spears comes in and drops Darby, which showed that Sting is not a good babysitter. He's he's not good. He's supposed to be keeping an eye on Darby. He dropped the ball. And now um, I next Wednesday, we're getting uh, Sean Spears versus Darby Allen. And Sean Spears is an interesting one in that he's kind of in that, in that middle of the pack. Um roster wise and I'm, I'm not sure where he's going at this point with the number of wrestlers that have been brought in and with the amount of talent that's on this roster some guys are going to go there will be some guys who are going to go and it'll be interesting to see if sean spears gets an actual push out of this or if this is just a chance for darby allen to to win the match uh, against sean spears and get his momentum back after the loss to cm punk not that i think there's any momentum loss in losing to cm punk but you don't want to lose back-to-back -back matches. So that, that segment was very short. 
Like, it was, I think, two and a half. It felt like it was two minutes, two and a half minutes, maybe. And I thought, okay, that that should have been longer. That should have been more drawn out. There should have been more drama to this. It wasn't. Um, then we get the six-woman tag match. Uh, or as they call it, the trios. And I, I really want to see trios tag belts um, for the men. I'd like to see tag belts for the women as well. But it was Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, and Rebel against Ruby Soho, Chris Statlander, and Riho. And Jamie Hayter and Chris Statlander, I would like to see a prolonged feud between the two of them. They are able to perform power maneuvers that a lot of other women wish they could do. And, and they're pretty smooth with it. Uh, Jamie Hayter is, has spent a long time um, working on the craft in wrestling. I think she's a much better wrestler now than she was the last time she was in AEW. She's in better shape than she was the last time she was in AEW. And it, it was an impressive fight altogether. And of course, what it does is it sets it up so that Riho got beat up for a lot of the match. Um, and then eventually, with all the shenanigans going on, you end up with Rebel in the ring with Ruby Soho. Soho hits her with the kick, and Rebel eats the pin. That's why Rebel's in the six-woman tag match. Because you're not going to have Chris get pinned. Chris just got pinned at the pay-per-view, and you're trying to keep her momentum. Ruby's not getting pinned. She's the number one contender. Riho's just started wrestling again in AEW. She's not eating the pin. Jamie Hayter has been pinned too many times. And Britt Baker is the women's champion. So you're left with Rebel. And again, I still think that eventually we're going to see Britt Baker turn against Rebel. And Rebel will become a sympathetic face out of all that. So that's, that's what I think is eventually going to happen. And then they got into the main event. And before that, they interviewed Pillman and Caster. And it was Mark Henry doing the interview. And you know what? I kind of like this. I kind of like this format of interviewing the wrestlers right before the match in a way that feels like it's it's setting it up, where it's not... It didn't feel as scripted as what we often see in WWE. WWE tries to do this thing, and sometimes it works very well. Uh, tonight I watched some of SmackDown, and I thought they set up Edge versus Seth Rollins really well. Uh, but in this one, Brian Pillman Jr. versus Max Caster. Uh, Caster throwing insults at Pillman. Uh, and, and Griff Garrison, Julia Hart, not there. Uh, Brian Pillman Jr. came out wearing gear that looked a lot like the gear that his dad used to wear. And you know what's funny? Until tonight, I never put it together that Brian Pillman Jr. wore orange and black because Cincinnati reasons. And yet here I am a Bengals fan. So it's in Cincinnati, hometown guy. And you know Pillman's going to beat Caster, but they did throw some doubt in there. So the Pillman family's at ringside again, and they just seemed overjoyed to be there. Uh, Caster does his rap at the beginning, of course, because that's what he does. And, and then, of course, his tag partner's like, hey, you know, you're on thin ice, which seems to be now part of their shtick, that Max isn't going to be in trouble for things he says. Um, Pillman then attacked Caster before the bell. And he's still wearing the jacket and everything. Uh, but, of course, we end up with the acclaimed versus Pillman. So, Caster just basically dumps Pillman out of the ring, get the ref tied up, and then his tag partner is, you know, attacking Brian Pillman Jr. It is old-fashioned wrestling, uh, very reminiscent of old NWA mid-80s stuff. Again, it kind of reminds me of the Horseman, where you'd be in against one guy, and at the start of the show, I'd be like, man, I hope Dusty can... Oh... All the horsemen are out there. So, yeah, it kind of feels like that. Uh, there were Flying Brian chants uh, that were out there, and I thought that was great. Um, I thought Pillman Jr. held it together pretty well. It, it had to be pretty moving for him to be at his hometown in front of a crowd and and to have them chanting his, his, his dad's name of Flying Brian, which he's taken on as well, and to have um, family at ringside. It had to be a big moment. Um, and then it was a springboard clothesline that he got to win the match over Caster, which Brian Sr. used to do as well. So overall, this was just a really good building moment for Pillman Jr. And then after that, the acclaimed attack, because it's what they do. Uh, so they attack Pillman Jr. And I thought, okay, so Griff Garrison's got to come out to make the save. It's actually John Moxley, who also calls Cincinnati home, and he made the save uh, for Brian Pillman Jr. tonight. So uh, they they you know they were together at the end of it. The crowd goes home happy. And it, it it really feels like, and I mean I'm wearing the varsity varsity blonde shirt here, that as much as this group works, that they might be leaning towards having Pillman go out on his own 
and you know even if it's just for a few weeks or something i know they're building up to the mjf match i think they've got something here i do i think the fans will get behind pillman jr now it's easy to get the hometown crowd behind brian pillman jr it's easy to do that uh the the real question is going to be as they move on to in weeks to come will the crowd get behind them and i think they will if you've watched that dark side of the ring on brian pillman senior and you've seen brian pillman jr break down during that honestly it is it is a very moving thing so i'm i'm so happy to see brian pillman jr having some success and as much as i i like the varsity blondes team um and i think if they did break the three up i think julia would be fine uh she's 19 she's learning the learning the business um but i do wonder with griff like is does griff garrison end up in another tag team it what would happen with him with Pillman Jr., I think he'd be okay. So Griff might be the one out of the three that I'm not sure if the Varsity Blondes broke up, how popular he would be or where he'd go from there. But uh, it was a good show. Uh, it wasn't wasn't as, you know, holy crap moments uh, filled as, as Dynamite, but it was a good hour. A uh, good solid hour, and we had three matches in there. I, it, it does feel like Rampage should be two hours. I'm just going to come out and say it. It feels like this should be a two-hour show. Um, I enjoy one-hour shows. I enjoy it. I do. But it feels like with some of the storylines that were going on tonight, if they'd had just a couple, even if it was 90 minutes, just add 90, just add 30 minutes so you can tell more of a story with the Darby Allen staying part and then maybe a little bit more of the, the women's tag. Or you could throw another match in there too. So um, we'll see if it stays at 60 minutes. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happen upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. For all your support, I will talk to you again soon.